Today I'm going to show you an incredible publication in Brain Journal of Neurology by senior author Professor Demetrios Karousas of the Hadassah MS Center of the very first successful randomized double-blind sham control treatment of intravenous and intrathecal mesenchymal stem cells in the treatment of progressive MS. Let's have some fun. Now the term stem cells can cause a lot of confusion because there's already an established treatment called hematopoietic stem cell transplant which has been used in MS for over 30 years. And the way that hematopoietic stem cell transplant works is that toxic drugs are given to wipe out the immune system and then the stem cell transplant is given to replenish the immune system and it can be highly effective and I have a separate video on that topic. However, mesenchymal stem cells are different and in the treatment I'm discussing in this video, no immunosuppression is given aside from the patient's regular disease modifying therapy. By the way, my name is Brandon Bieber and I make videos about multiple sclerosis every Wednesday, so please subscribe and ring the bell for notifications and if you appreciate this video, please click like. So this study was done at the Hadassah MS Center and Unit of Neuroimmunology and Hadassah is actually a women's Jewish organization, but they also do medical research and have hospitals. And this was a phase two trial, but it may be followed up by a larger phase three trial. But despite the small sample size they used a very good methodology it was randomized and double blind and double sham meaning they gave a fake intravenous treatment and a fake intrathecal treatment so no one knew if they were getting the stem cells or the placebo they had a total of 48 people with progressive MS and one-third or 16 were in the intrathecal group and so they had a procedure similar to a spinal tap but instead of drawing out fluid they injected the stem cells directly into the cerebrospinal fluid 16 got the intravenous treatment and 16 got placebo. And the stem cells were autologous, in other words, from the patient's own bone marrow, and they gave approximately a million cells per kilogram. And the biopharmaceutical company Neurogenesis worked with Hadassah to use a proprietary technique to convert the bone marrow aspirate into purified mesenchymal stem cells. To get into the study, you had to have an EDSS, or Expanded Disability Status Scale, of 3 to 6.5. EDSS is a measure of disability in MS, and I have a separate video on the complicated scoring, but basically an EDSS of 3 would be considered moderate disability, and 6.5 means that a cane, excuse me, a walker is required for mobility. You had to be equal to or less than age 65 and be worsening in the past year prior to the study. Now, after six months, people changed groups, so people originally randomized to placebo, they got a chance to get the real treatment and vice versa. And the primary endpoint of the study was either a change in the EDSS or one of the EDSS functional systems and if you want to know what that means just click the other video. So this slide just shows the trial design in visual format. You can see there were 48 patients and as I said they were randomized into three groups intrathecal stem cells, intravenous stem cells, and placebo. And then after six months, the crossover occurred, and half the people get intrathecal treatment went on to continue that treatment, but half were changed to placebo. And same with the IV group. Half continued the IV treatment of stem cells, but half were changed to placebo. And then those who got placebo, half got the intrathecal stem cells during the final six months, but half got intravenous stem cells. So everyone got a chance to have the treatment at some point, and you can see the different study visits and the different assessments they did during those study visits. And this shows the baseline characteristics of the 48 people in the study. Unlike the normal sex distribution of MS, which is about 75% female, there were actually 28 males and only 20 females in the study. The authors think maybe because men were a little bit more likely to fail treatment or possibly they just were more interested in entering the study. The average age was 47.6. There were 20 people with active disease and 28 people with inactive disease, meaning that they did not have relapses or active lesions in the last year prior to the study. Most had secondary progressive MS, but seven people had primary progressive MS. The average disease duration was 12.7 years, and the average EDSS increase was 0.73 prior to the study, and it made sense since you had to be worsening just to get into the study. The mean EDSS at baseline was 5.6, and just to give you a sense, an EDSS of 5.5 means that you can walk without a cane, but you can walk more than 100 meters, but less than 200 meters. So that's sort of the typical person who was in this study. And the average number of disease-modifying therapies prior 
prior to the study was 2.58. And you can see the individual characteristics of some of the people who were in the study, their sex, their age and inclusion, their disease duration, whether they had secondary or primary progressive MS, their EDSS at screening, and you can see the different disease modifying therapies that supposedly didn't work in the past and their current disease modifying therapy. And you can see that a lot of them were on Gelenia or Fingolimod. And this is an S1P receptor modulator that traps lymphocytes within the lymph nodes, preventing them from getting into the brain and spinal cord. And interestingly, Gelenia was studied formally in a study called the INFORM study in primary progressive MS, and it was actually ineffective. Although a very similar drug, Siponimod or Mazent, did show some benefit in secondary progressive MS. And you can see that a lot of these individuals were taking Gelenia. I'm not exactly sure why. Maybe it's just a popular treatment in this region. So now we'll review the results of the study. And it gets a little bit messy because we're looking at pooled data. So for instance, if we look at what happened to people who got intrathecal mesenchymal stem cells, we're looking at people who got the treatment at any point and what happened to them for six months after the treatment. Now you might think that maybe the effect is delayed. Maybe you get stem cells now and then nine months later it helps you. But this study suggests no. This study suggests that they help almost instantaneously, but that the effect goes away after six months. And so we're going to look at the percentage who are stable or improved or worsened in terms of EDSS. Again, a measure of disability in terms of MS. And it turns out it's a very nonlinear scale. So for lower levels of EDSS, a one point difference doesn't matter as much. And so they wanted to see a full point difference to show a meaningful change. But for EDSS levels at 5.5 and above, they considered a 0.5 difference to be significant. And so let's look at the intrathecal group. You can see that at three months, 30 out of 31 people were stable or improved versus only one that was worsened. At six months, it was 28 who were stable or improved versus two who were worsened. In the intravenous group, it wasn't quite as impressive, but still very good. At three months and six months, it was 27 who were stable improved and five who were worsened versus four who had worsened at six months. This is the placebo group, and you can see the results are much worse. At three months, only 15 were stable or improved versus 16 who had worsened. And at six months, only 11 were stable and had improved versus 20 who had worsened. And this graph shows the exact same thing in a slightly different way. You're looking at average changes in EDSS in the different group. And the first half of the graph shows what happens in the first six months. And the second half shows what happened after the crossover. And so here's the starting point. And you can see on average, those in the placebo group got worse by approximately 0.3 on average on the EDSS scale. But those receiving either intrathecal or intravenous stem cells stayed approximately approximately the same. The same thing happened to the placebo group in the second six months. They got worse on average, but both the intravenous and intrathecal groups improved, and the intrathecal group improved a little bit more, although the difference versus the intravenous group was not statistically significant. Now we'll move to some of the secondary endpoints of the study. This chart looks at relapses, and again, we're comparing intrathecal mesenchymal stem cells versus IV versus placebo, and there are three columns. The first column is the run-in, which is the baseline prior to the study, and cycle one and two are the two six-month periods. And you can see there were far fewer relapses in the cycle one and two periods in the intrathecal stem cell group compared to placebo. And this was highly statistically significant. Look at all these relapses. It looks like there were a little bit fewer relapses in the IV group, but this was not statistically significantly different versus placebo. They also looked at active lesions or lesions that take up the gadolinium contrast dye. And again, you're looking at the run in period prior to the study and cycle one and two. And you can see that there were fewer active lesions in the intrathecal group versus placebo, but it was not a statistically significant difference. And one thing I'll note is that a lot of these people had active lesions in general, seven active lesions, three active lesions in the run in period, eight active lesions, seven active lesions. This is not really typical of progressive MS. So I'm not sure how much we can extrapolate this data to people with progressive 
at MS who are really not making new lesions. However, despite that caveat, the data are incredibly impressive from a scientific and statistical standpoint. Again, we're looking at the primary outcome, and they did it in two different ways. One was just looking at the change in EDSS. That's the first column here. And you can see the number of people who failed the treatment, meaning that their EDSS worsened. 6.7% failed in the intrathecal group. 9.7% failed in the IV group versus 41.9% in the sham or placebo treatment and look at these p-values 0 0.0003 0 0.0008 and then they did it in a sort of more sensitive way where you could fail treatment either by worsening on the EDSS or in just one of the functional systems so just a very slight change and 31% failed in the intrathecal group 27.6% failed in the IV group and 76.7% failed the placebo treatment again look at these p-values 0 0.0004, 0 0.0002, so it was highly statistically significant. They did a lot of different statistical analyses of this very complicated study, and it's impossible to show them all, but I'll show you a few interesting ones. This is looking just at the intrathecal group versus the sham group. So the intrathecal treatment group, they had more new CD25 positive T cells. These are suppressor or regulatory T cells involved in controlling the immune system, believed to be deficient in multiple sclerosis. People getting the treatment were much more likely to have no evidence of disease activity, meaning no relapses and no new lesions, 58.6% versus only 9.7% in the placebo group. Those getting the treatment were more likely to have increases in activity in the motor network based on functional MRI studies, and they did better on cognitive testing based on the PASAT cognitive test, and they had less flare T2 lesions, and their time 25-foot walk was faster. Another interesting group to look at is the eight people who got intrathecal stem cells twice. So they got it initially and then they were again randomized to get it six months later. And just to compare them to their baseline. So this is not compared to placebo. This is just compared to the same patients 12 months ago. And on average, their EDSS decreased by 0.188. Their ambulation score, which is one of the functional subscores of the EDSS, decreased by 1.25. And of course, less is better. Their sum of functional systems on the EDSS, again, less is better, decreased by 4.86. And perhaps Perhaps most impressively, their time 25 foot walk, the time it took them to walk 25 foot feet, decreased on average by 5.8 seconds, a tremendous difference. Now there was a lot of variation in the time 25 foot walk, so it ended up not being statistically significant, but they were six seconds faster. That really is a tremendous difference. They also looked at side effects, and really there were no major side effects other than the expected back pain and headache, which you can get from a spinal tap, really occurred in the study. There were reports of headache, back pain, upper respiratory tract infection, urinary tract infection, sinusitis, a fall, a hand hand fracture. Interestingly, in the intrathecal group, someone got scabies, which is a skin infection, although that probably had nothing to do with the treatment, and someone got Bell's palsy, which is inflammatory facial paralysis, which could have been related to the treatment, but it's hard to say, and this is quite a common disorder. But really nothing bad happened. No meningitis, no weird tumors in the central nervous system, and no real major adverse effects at all. So to sum it up, this publication came as a pleasant surprise. I was very impressed by their data, although I do have two major caveats. One is that these patients were just too unstable. There were too many having relapses, too many with several active lesions, which again is a little bit unusual for progressive MS. And I think that a lot of them were just on the wrong disease-modifying therapy and should have been escalated to something stronger in terms of disease-modifying therapy, regardless of stem cell treatments. So I'd love to see a longer study in people who were actually stable with progressive MS and not see so many relapses as so many active lesions, because it really confounds the data. Also, I think the six-month crossover design was a little bit unusual. It's hard for me to believe that this treatment works for six months and then immediately completes completely stops working, how could they have gotten so lucky to predict that in advance? I think if they do do a phase three trial, I'd want to see a longer study, two years randomized data, and maybe an open label study after that if it's proven to be effective. And hopefully that comes to fruition because I have to say preliminarily, it does look like it's effective and safe. But I'd like to know your opinion. Would you take this treatment if you had the opportunity to? And do you have any suggestions for future videos?